Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I'm sitting down with the guy that is 100% responsible for my absolute love and affinity for backgrounds within animation, Chris Suriotis. During this chat, we talk about how he broke into animation, working on Kid Cosmic with Craig McCracken, his interesting interaction with Adam Sandler on 8 Crazy Nights, and his 3D sculpting. Just as a heads up, this weekend, May 13th, 2023, if you're in the Alhambra, California area, a very special art show will be taking place. Created by Craig McCracken, will be on display at Gallery Nucleus. If you're there on the 13th, you can meet Craig and get a very special signed poster. Tickets and posters are limited, so book in advance. You'll be able to see some of the greatest pieces of art that Craig has ever created throughout his illustrious career, so make sure you get tickets to it. This week's guest, Chris, will actually have some of his 3D sculpted work from Kid Cosmic on display. So make sure you stop by and you tell Craig, hey, and congrats. You can find out more details by going to gallerynucleus.com, or you can click the link below and it will direct you to their website. And don't forget, if you're enjoying the show, man, make sure you drop us a rating and a review. Helps out tremendously. Enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Listen to My Head Podcast. I'm here Julian today. I'm joined by Chris. Chris, thanks for coming on the show. How are you? Good. How you doing? I'm fantastic, man. Uh, this, is one, this one's a real pleasure to do because your work has permeated this noggin for the better part of two, three years now. Um, you know, I had Craig, I told you already, but I had Craig McCracken on and I literally had to stop him when we were talking Kid Cosmic. I had to tell him halfway through his his uh, breakdown of Kid Cosmic, I was like, I was mesmerized by the backgrounds. The backgrounds, and he was like, well, we don't, we want everything to be symbiotic. We don't want you to be pulled one way or the other. The music, everything needs to work in symbiosis. And I was like, well, I get that. But the backgrounds on this show were magical um i would love to know not so much how you got into kid cosmic but man uh i i love backgrounds I, I you have sent me down so many rabbit holes by looking up backgrounds colors everything that you could possibly do with backgrounds is because of you man so i would love to know how you kind of got to doing what you're doing okay so it's a long story that's okay <laughs> i love long stories um yeah i uh I had, I had kind of a weird path to animation. Um, I started off as a kid, you know, drawing uh, all the time, getting in trouble at school for not paying attention, drawing all of my notebooks. And, and uh, you know, I was always the kid who knew who could draw in school. And uh, so that, that made me think, well, I'll probably do this for a living. Um, I thought maybe I was really into comic books at the time as a kid. So it was all superheroes and I played a lot of D and D as a kid. So I was always drawing, you know, sword and sorcery kinds of stuff and really big Frank Frazetta fan. Um, so, uh, when I got to art school, I realized, uh, there was a lot of guys who were really good and I sort of felt intimidated. Like, how am I going to compete in New York with these guys as an illustrator? So I went into, I, I majored in advertising and graphic design, and that's what I got my degree in. And, uh, you know, I was, I was living the life in New York after graduation. Um, I got a job at, at an ad agency in the theater district. Uh, I, think, I think my office I had a window right across the street from where Cats was playing um, at the Winter Garden. And, uh, you know, it was okay. It was, it was a pretty interesting, interesting career, but... Um, you know, I was hiring illustrators to do work for me and they all were like, not that great. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I could fucking do this. <laughs> so um, that was always in my head. Like, am I really doing what I want to do? I, I'd rather just draw for a living. And then um, a friend of mine uh, who had graduated from Pratt, not, actually he, he went to Pratt Institute with me in Brooklyn, but he had transferred to Cal Arts out in California and he got into animation. And so he was back visiting a bunch of us in New York, telling us about his new crazy career in animation. Uh, so this would have been, I don't know, 1991, 92, maybe. And uh, so he was like telling us all about this, this new show he was working on called Ren and Stimpy, and you have to watch it. And, and he was showing us the episode and it was, it was kind of blowing me away, you know? And the thing that also um, stuck with him is like, wait a second, Jordan was okay, but he wasn't that great. I could draw as well as that guy. So that was another thing that sort of stuck in my head. Like maybe, maybe one day I could do something like that. I don't know. Um, so a little time went by. I was, I was continuing to work in New York. And then um, 
I was subletting and I finally got moved out of my mom's house in Queens. I was subletting uh, a basement apartment in Manhattan and uh, it was great for the summer, you know, and I was finally, you know, living the life I thought I was going to be living, you know, the young urban professional rollerblading to work every morning, which was like a thing <laughs> back then. Um, does anybody roll that anymore? Wow. And uh, so one night, I, and it was great, you know, it was three weeks that were really great. And then uh, the water main break happened or not the water main but the pipe in the guy's ceiling broke and the whole apartment got flooded one night and so i was basically i had to move back home uh and while i was looking for another apartment a couple of buddies of mine from high school were at a bar one night uh and they were talking about moving to california so you know they're just joking around and saying hey chris you want to come you know for a goof or whatever and i was and i was thinking like well I don't know, maybe. <laughs> so I said, yeah, how about, yeah, I'll go. Why not? I just like decided that night. And, uh, you know, I had to save a few dollars and they, they moved out a few months before I did. But, but yeah, a few months later, I was in California, never been there before, just walked off the plane. They picked me up and drove me to the, the apartment they were renting in Huntington Beach, a block from the beach. And uh, I was rollerblading on the beach in February the next day, January. So it was just pretty well living the dream, you know, and uh, so, okay, this is really going to be a long story, but um, I was working, I, so I do advertising, so I was doing that for a while in, in, in California, moved into a little more interesting kind of advertising, I got into entertainment advertising, so I was designing move, movie posters, which was pretty fun, uh, but uh, advertising is a killer business, it's like you're, you finish work, it's already 7.30 at night, and then the and then the boss walks in and says, client needs this for tomorrow morning. And that happened like three times, four times a week, you know? And I just quit. I said, fuck it, I'm done. Yeah. I can't do it anymore. And uh, my, my girlfriend, my now wife, wasn't too happy about that because she was basically paying the rent while I was, you know, walking the dog to Starbucks in the morning. Um, but uh, I managed to, she found a, uh, an ad in, in Hollywood Reporter Variety or something that there was going to be a, uh, a job fair in the animation business, for the animation business. And uh, it was like in a week. And, I, and she was like, you should go. You've been wanting to do something like this for a while now. So I didn't have anything. All I had was like advertising shit, you know, but um. And I had some drawings I had done and I scribbled a few things. And I, I think I have drawings on like loose leaf paper and fucking cocktail napkins and shit. I don't know. I threw it all together in a book and uh, I went down to the, con the convention center and started showing my stuff around. And um, I got to this one table where I met this really nice guy named Jerry Richardson, who was just like super enthusiastic and gung ho and encouraging and, I guess he saw that I was, I wasn't a kid. I was 27 by now. Um, so he, he realized I was somebody who was, you know, not some kid right out of school, fairly mature person. And he was like, Hey, Steve, who is another guy who's working the booth, a guy named Steve Mize. says, you want to give this guy a test for background design? And, uh, so I got introduced to a guy named Steve Myers who became, uh, probably my greatest mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, so he was like, Steve's like, yeah, you, here's the test and take a week and we'll, we'll let you know, you know? So I took the test and they gave me a job and all of a sudden I'm working in fucking animation. Do you remember the so, test? Um, it was for a show that they were work. They were, they needed some people for the second season. It was, um, it was the animated, uh, version of Jumanji. Okay. I don't know if you recall that show. Yes. I wasn't off for very long. It was done. I mean, it was, it was, I don't know if it was a particularly popular show, but some of the most talented people I ever met and mm -hmm. still to this day I've ever met were on that show. And yeah. it was a really great first job to have. Yeah. I remember that one. Uh, it was definitely a flash in the pan. It was, Robin Williams has always been my favorite actor of all time. And when I saw that movie, when I saw the movie Jumanji, and then I saw, it might have been like Kids WB or maybe it was Fox. I can't remember what channel it came on. But when Jumanji came on, the cartoon, I was like, oh, man, this is going to be so cool. 
and then it, it you know it makes it into your rotation and then the next thing you know when the rest of the seasons are getting picked up the following year you're like man this this block got a little lighter why did that show go off yep so it was one of those ones that i fondly remember very it very out there as far as the design goes i mean you know shortly yeah. after that you would see things like wild thornberries come on that had similar yet different uh-huh you know, different styles. So yeah, yeah. I, I remember that animated Jumanji quite well. Um, well the guy who, who uh, was the creative force behind that show, as far as the design, mm-hmm. um, uh, was a guy named Everett Peck. Yeah, and oh, yeah. he just he passed was, away. Yeah. You know that name? Yeah. Yeah, so he was the creator of Duckman, mm-hmm. which was on, uh, I don't know, was it on Comedy Central or something? Yeah. Back then? Um, and uh, so all the designs were inspired by his style. And it was funny, um, I, was, I was having lunch with a guy named Gordon Hammond, who, uh, who that was one of his first jobs in animation too. Um, and he was a character designer on that show. And we were talking about Steve Myers and he was like, you know, cause, uh, cause Steve was just like this genius that we, we all still talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can't even find his stuff on the internet. He has like zero internet presence. He got out of the business a while ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, he was like, did you know that Everett was actually in, kind of more influenced by Steve than Steve was by Everett? And Steve was one of Everett's students in, at, at uh, I think it was Otis. They went to school with him and Jerry Richardson went together. Uh, they were his students. So they were the guys running the show uh, under him. So who was there you know, former instructor at that school. Yeah, I think Everett just passed away not too long ago, man. Uh, year before last, last year, somewhere around there. Um, yeah. I actually had him uh, slated to come on, and then he, I guess he got sick, and then, uh, you know, Pat found out, I was getting ready to check in, see if uh, right. he was going to go, and then I saw that his, I think his daughter, or maybe his son had, you know, mm-hmm. put up that beautiful picture of his his desk. Yeah, and, yeah Jerry man. Richardson also passed on a few years ago. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah that I, like I said, Jumanji. It was just I loved the style and being a kid during that time. Like I said, I was born in '89, so getting to see a lot of these shows um, from that early age, I was just blown away. Um, one thing I did want to I did want to hit on though, uh, when you're given that test and you said the they they had asked if you wanted to do a background test, what was it about your portfolio on your uh, lovely beverage napkins and loose leaf paper that you had in there that screamed uh, backgrounds to these guys? Did they just see something that you possibly Nothing. did or no? Nothing. I don't know. I mean, it was, it wasn't even, there weren't even backgrounds in it. It was character designs. Cause I didn't know that was even like a job. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely, man. If we're being honest, when I first started this podcast, I assumed that if, so if I'm talking to Chris, right, I assume you're doing character design. I'm assuming you're doing the backgrounds. I'm assuming you did everything. And it wasn't until like I really started diving deep because I've loved animation since a little kid, like most people. Um, mm-hmm. But I didn't know the different jobs, the different aspects, the different roads you guys can take to go. I, I didn't know it was just so fast. So when I finally started talking to character designers and painters and this and that, I was like, holy shit, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was. Um, and then there's all these different specializations that you guys do. Um, yeah. When you're going into backgrounds, uh, you know, I've heard this so many times by so many of you artists that everybody grows up and they want to draw Batman. They want to draw Superman. Not so much for the comics, but when you're going through school and you are the artist in the school, everybody wants you to draw their favorite superhero. They want you to draw this. You're a character-driven artist at that stage. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's just a natural human tendency. You know, Absolutely. Like, let's, you know, you look at cave paintings, they're not drawing mountains and landscapes, right? It's yeah. all It's all creatures and people. Absolutely. Um, so when you hear that, you know, and Steve goes, yeah, we'll give him a background test or a, a test for backgrounds. Uh, were you just stoked that you were breaking into animation at that point or getting your foot? Yeah, in I, didn't care. I, I thought, you know, hey, I, I don't even think I was thinking ahead like, oh, maybe this will be a stepping stone to doing yeah. something else. I just I just wanted a job where I got to draw all day. Yeah. You know, I was sitting there, you know, at that ad agency it was called global doghouse that was the name i think they're still around um and you know i would spend my day looking at fonts Mm -hmm. like hey let's try it in you know futura bold american typewriter (laughs) all right let's try it in you know it's like i i I would do that all fucking day yeah you know it's just it's just soul killing for me so some people love that stuff. Some people love typography. I like it to a point. I like to do it. But uh, 
it's actually not one of my more favorite things to do as a background designer is mm -hmm. when I got to do stuff with a lot of text. Um, but anyway, that's another discussion. Absolutely. So I'm sorry, your question was, um, oh, just, uh, what they might've seen that kind of push you towards background. And then when you started doing backgrounds, was it something that just you had to find the love for, or is it something you initially got like, Oh shit, I really well, enjoyed well, this. Well, I think the reason I loved it right from the start was because, um, Steve Myers was such a brilliant guy. And the stuff he designed was so uh, unique. Mm -hmm. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, just the way he pushed proportions and and uh, just the crazy ideas he would come up with were just amazing. So um, very original, highly, highly original work. And it really like, you know, I, I suppose if, if he was having me design characters, I would have, you know, been like, hey, I want to be a character designer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was a great first job to have. And it was just just something I ended up getting good at and and liked and stuck with. And and background design for me just became uh just my thing, you know. I I I think artists get pigeonholed after a while, but uh for me it's worked out really well, you know. I'm going to take a step out of this, this conversation. I'm going to take a, you know, leap forward. Knowing what you know now, would you want to go back and try something different? Or have you had as much fun as you possibly could have with animation through background? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's, you can always say, well, what if I had tried this? Sure, I would have. I, I, it would be interesting to see what kind of a storyboard artist or, or a painter or character designer I would have turned out to be. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I still, I suppose I still could do that if I wanted to. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I kind of got my, my character design itch scratched with the, uh, the 3d sculpting work I do. I don't know if you've, I do. Out I, I really like it. Yes. But, um, yeah, that doing that and, and designing characters in three dimensions and learning how to turn them, like take a, like a 2d design, like for instance, the kind of design Craig does. Mm -hmm. and learning how to sculpt that in 3D and figure out how to turn something that can't, it doesn't really work as a three-dimensional design. Like his stuff looks great from certain angles, but you can't just like rotate it and yeah. make it look right. So it, it was always like a really fun challenge to design characters like that, that you couldn't really, they weren't like designed like Disney characters, you know what I mean? Where they, they look real as far as dimensionally. Um, so I think that's really taught me a lot about character design and and how form works and that sort of thing. I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, no, it does. I, I always like asking that question because sometimes people find what they like. Like for me, I absolutely I love what I do for my day job. I love cooking. Um, but if I could literally have my hands in bread dough all day, I would have so much more enjoyment with work. I love work. There's something very primal about bread. I mean, you literally bread was civilizations were built around bread. You would break bread with friends and enemies and enemies would become friends because you would share a loaf of bread. And it, it, it's the essence. It's water, it's flour and it's salt. It's all it really is. Right. And then between temperatures and times and fermentations and all of this other shit that goes into it. You can essentially make anything that your heart's content with flour, water, and salt. You know, so when I get to step out and see other people that are masters at their crafts, and then there's so many different avenues you guys can take to go down, and there's so many different ways you can do what you guys do. Um, I always find it fascinating to see if it's something you would stick with or if it's something that you're like, hey, man, I kind of want to test the waters. I already lived this life as something. Yeah. Let me try to do something different. So. Well, you know, I, I actually did have a chance to get into character layout um, at one point because there was, um, there was a time when I was looking for a job and uh, a friend of mine who I'd worked with, God, where did I, a guy named Mike Kim, he was, I think he was supervising directing on a show called The Oblongs. I don't know, that was another flash from the pan. That's another good one too. And they were doing character layout in-house. Do you know what character layout is? It's not yeah. the same as character design. It's yeah. keyframes and whatnot. Taking a storyboard out uh, and and essentially doing it's almost like being an in-betweener mm -hmm. in, in a way. Um, 
but uh, yeah, I took a test for that and he was like, yeah, you, you could do this. You want, you want a job? And I, but the money was so shit that yeah. I just couldn't bring myself to take it. But, you know, I, I would say in hindsight, uh, if there are any regrets I've had is that usually I go for the money. Yeah. Other than the thing that is probably going to be more, more of an adventure. satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, when you got a wife and kids and you got to put them through college, you got that's you got to think about that kind of stuff. So. Absolutely. I didn't. Of course, I, well, I don't think I was married or had kids then. So. I you were planning for the future though, Chris. That's what Chris was doing. Yeah. Um, so, well, I, so had, I had been making a lot more money in my last job, and I was just like, really? Yeah. And I think, oh, wait, thanks anyway. Hey, man, but, like I said, sometimes you got to take that. I was unemployed for a couple more months. I should have just taken the job. Hey, man, who knows, though, man? man I might not be talking 20-plus years down the road. I might not be talking to you because, like I said, right. you're – Maybe I only would have been a mediocre character layout guy or something. Oh, like, like if – I don't know, man. If you were half the half the character designer that you were for that you are for for backgrounds, I, th I think you'd be quite the uh, craftsman. Um, like I said at the beginning of the show, man, Kid Cosmic. Watching this one with my kid, first thing that stood out was these backgrounds. Um, I think Craig walked us through like his aesthetics and his styles, what he wanted as far as tone, characters. Mm -hmm backgrounds music and everything uh when he's on my show but uh when you know he's approaching you to for you to come on kid cosmic obviously you guys had worked prior to that um what are some of the things that he have ideas already is he coming to you he's like hey this is kind of the story what do you want to world build here how does that whole conversation play out um well if you know craig you'll know that he pretty much knows exactly what he wants mm -hmm. um so he had already i think i I, I listened to that podcast and I think he mentioned that that Kid Cosmic was something that he'd been fooling around with for like yeah. 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So he had a lot of material to go through. He basically did like, I mean, it was almost like a daily comic strip or something he did with these characters. So I knew what he was looking for. And he had also done a shit ton of photography. Mm -hmm. Like he just went out to places that were in areas that looked like the show. Yeah. Up, uh, you know, if you drive outside of LA, there's if if you just go um, on some of these less traveled roads, like for instance, the the diner that the show is based on um, is an actual place that we ended up having our rap party at. Really? So yeah, it's called I think it's called the the halfway house or something. I'm a huge um, diner fan. But, but Craig, uh, he he already had a whole ton of photographs of all these places for me to reference so it was just a matter of digesting it all and coming up with something that you know checked all the boxes and was fun to look at and that's that's what we went with you we liked it so uh, man like i said you guys absolutely crushed it uh one thing that I, I i thought was just so striking you know with the show with the backgrounds you know the colors the color palette that was chosen was absolutely stunning as well now I haven't had too many background. Unfortunately, I have not had too many background uh, designers on. So this question might, it's coming from ignorance for sure. But when you, like you said, Craig is somebody that knows what he wants already. When he approaches whoever he's going to approach, he knows where he wants to go. He knows what he wants to do. Um, but when you are designing these backgrounds, do, do background designers have any input on what the color scheme might be? Or is it just, it's collectively agreed upon? Or how does that whole process work? Well, generally speaking in tv it's not a thing no. background design and background paint are different departments mm -hmm. um, a lot of background designers paint and a lot of background painters design and they they kind of wear both hats at different points in their careers um i never did any background paint i think i painted like like two backgrounds in my entire career in color for like a pilot or something mm -hmm. um it was just not something I, I mean, I, you know, I wish I had, had done a little more uh, study on that and because it's, it's kind of fun, you know, like I've yeah. lately, I've, I've had a gig lately where I've been doing basically black and white paintings mm -hmm. and it's not really that much different. I think color uh, painting is knowing how to paint in color is not much different than knowing how to paint in black and white, in my opinion, um, because value is the most important part of yeah. a painting uh so if you if you're really good with values and light and shadow 
the color, you know, learning the color and color theory, that's, I mean, that's fairly basic. Um, I can do it, um, but it's not really a thing for me. But yeah, like I said, it's, it's generally two separate departments. The, it's rare that in TV, or at least now, up until now has been, has been rare for someone to design backgrounds from start to finish as far as the, the layout and the color. Will you have any input on what some of those colors might be? Because you're designing, the, you're helping design the world. Obviously, that is their job. Sometimes I, I throw color on them. Yeah. But uh, they never come back with those colors. No. So. <laughs> like I said, you. I, you... Think, I think one time I did I did some stuff in um, black and red med, Sharpie. Mm -hmm. And the painter, uh, a friend of mine, Sana Hong, who was on uh, My Life as a Teenage Robot. She liked that palette so much. She just painted it like that. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> though the layout was just, it was, I just did it in those two colors because I thought it would um, read better. You know? Yeah, uh, that's another great show too. I had Rob Renzetti on uh, probably my first year, I think. Such a such a cool dude. His his short, Mean and the Count, which got turned into like a six-part series. Like that that show, like it gets so overlooked so often by people in animation. Not people in animation, excuse me, fans of animation. If you want to see something very spectacular, go watch Mean in the Count. Um, the color palette, like that that show, I can 100% point to and say that is the reason I love the studio UPA, Mean in the Count. I didn't know about UPA until way after I should have known about UPA. I learned through it through Cartoon Network. But Rob, when I got to talk to Rob and I got to tell him, you know, how much I absolutely love that show. It was like I'm a huge Halloween fan. So it was like I was getting Halloween when it wasn't Halloween time seeing Mean in the Count. So uh, My Life as a Teenage Robot was another great one. Uh, very stylized. I love the colors choices on that one. Um, and like I said, anytime we can say Rob Renzetti is a cool dude, I'm going to say Rob Renzetti is a cool dude because like I said, he's a cool dude. Um, I agree. Yeah. So uh, another thing I wanted to, to, to circle to, man. So when... Something like the the kid cosmic or anything in general in your in your career. Obviously, you're gonna have pictures, you have references. Um, is there is there a certain style of world that you do you like to build more than the others? And is there one that might give you a little bit more difficulty? Um, style or setting? Because as far as style goes, um, I've worked in realistic styles. I've worked in very flat graphic styles and cartoony and bush and um. And to me, it's it's just a little different recipe each time with all the same ingredients I use every single time. Mm -hmm. to give you a cooking analogy. I mean, when you're when you're figuring out, like for instance, if you get put on a show and the style is already established, you have to deconstruct it to learn it. So you could say, oh, okay, so the line work is like shows A, B, and C that I've worked on, but the proportion and the perspective treatment is like shows C, D, and E I've worked on. And so it's just a matter of how you mix those ingredients together to, to best nail a style. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's something that I've gotten particularly good at because, um, you know, a lot of artists get, they sort of get pigeonholed into like, oh, he draws, he's, he's an action adventure guy, mm -hmm. you know, or, or this this guy's really good at cartoony comedy kind of stuff, but I've worked on kind of every style there is, I think, um, including 3D stuff. So um, I'm just meandering at this point. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what you're asking. No, absolutely, man. Uh, what I meant, oh, what you I were asking me about um, settings. About, That's what I meant. Is there a particular style I like, right? Settings. Settings more than style. I, I just used the wrong word. Settings. Okay. So setting, I would say yes. I would say I definitely prefer um, sci-fi fantasy kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably just from my childhood, you know, growing up on D&D &D and Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, Star Trek and all that. Conan the Barbarian. You know? What'd you roll in D and D? What's that? What'd you roll as in D and D? Oh God, I don't know. I gave that shit up as soon as I discovered girls and drinking. I was playing. Uh, <laughs> my, brother, my brother still is really into that stuff. Although he's not a, a D and D guy, he's really into the uh, the tabletop stuff, yeah. the war warhammer, warhammer yeah. and all that. Very very talented. Um, uh, miniature painter my brother and the sets he builds are in, insane as well 
I don't know the websites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, we, I was playing with my friends last year before we got extremely busy. Um, and I would always roll a wizard. I love wizards. I love casters. Um, but it sucked because, uh, you, you had to pick your character picture of what your character would look like. So I literally took Steve Buscemi from, um, shit. What was it? Uh, Mr. Deeds when he has crazy eyes. So his eyes were all over the place. So I literally uh -huh. cut his, cut his face off the picture and I put it on one of the Elven, um, shit, one of the Elven, I can't think of it, whatever, whatever it was, but from Lord of the Rings, put it on him. And then, so his eyes were going two different ways. So my DM at the time, he's like, all right, well, since you can't see straight and you can't see correctly, when you go to cast fireball, you have to roll one out of a hundred. And I was like, why? And he was like, well, one through 49, you nuke your party 50 through 100. You nuke uh, the, the enemy. When I tell you I nuke the party two thirds of the time, I nuke the party with fireballs. I was never putting warheads on foreheads with my fireballs. It was <laughs> bullshit, <laughs> but it kept it interesting. It kept it fun. Um, it was a lot of fun playing those games with the, the gang I, I I hung with back then. I mean, we had like seven or eight guys yeah. in junior high school that would all just pile into somebody's basement or bedroom or something. We'd just spend the whole day, you know, mm -hmm. drinking pop and rolling dice. It was great. Absolutely, man. Uh, so one of the one of the movies that uh, oh before before we get to that because you had said um, the sci fi oh, yeah, yeah setting and. And the things I can't stand are, well, I mean, but it's, I've done so much of it and you, you just kind of have to accept that it's part of the business is because it's, it's the most relatable to the audience, right? So there's always, there are always many, many, many shows, maybe most shows are about, they're about kids as the main characters and their lives, right? And then a lot of times they're in a modern day setting. So you get to draw a lot of, you know, junior high school hallways and, and classrooms and bedrooms and kitchens and shit like that. And it just, and malls, oh, gotta, gotta draw the malls. Um, and, you know, I guess it, depending on the style, it can be fun, but it's like, really, can we just kind of write something a little more interesting? <laughs> well, malls might be uh, phased out here pretty soon. I mean, everyone. Yeah, right. I think those are becoming, dying. I'll probably, I'll probably. Uh, Amazon warehouses. Do too much more of that stuff. Yeah, but yeah, so, sci-fi and fantasy are always the most fun for me. Now, was there anything that you would draw? Obviously, you'd drop, you know, Lord of the Rings, D and D, and and Star Wars. But is there anything on the animated front, whether it's anime or you know Western style animation, that you might have drawn influence from whenever you would need to get inspired? Um, you mean from like when I was a kid? No, no, like like in your everyday. Like obviously, we all go. Well, I mean, I I love uh, I love all the stuff that Miyazaki has done. Mm -hmm. um that's a real kind of easy go-to um there was a there was a exhibit i don't know if it's still up but they had an exhibit at the academy the television academy not too long ago that i took my family to and they had all these original paintings from spirited away and a yeah. bunch of his films and let me tell you something the guys the people who uh are responsible for that work are just it's bananas how much talent they have. It's just amazing when you see the just the meticulousness and the care that goes into those those originals. Yeah, I've I've gotten lucky this last couple years. Um, so for anime, growing up, I, I don't know what it was like for you. Um, you know, I grew up a comic book nerd, still am. I go and get my comic books every Wednesday. Um, you know, I got picked on for that shit quite quite a bit. I'm pretty sure you went through the same thing. Uh, just growing up, you know, getting teased, getting bullied for for like in Batman and, and Iron Man and shit like that. And now everybody knows Batman and Iron Man is the cool thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't have too much anime exposure, uh, you know, as a kid. You know, I had Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball, you know, a couple things here and there. It didn't start exploding uh, until, you know, recently as far as I go. Uh, I've got a 13-year-old and that's all he wants to consume is just anime this, anime that. He doesn't really give a shit about any other cartoons. Um, and getting to go back and watch, cause it's all on anything. You can buy it now. You can get it on HBO, but all of the Miyazaki films, I've been blown away. Just how beautiful every, there is not one wasted moment, movement, word, sound effect. Like I look at this and I'm like, this is perfection. I mean, I'm pretty sure if he looks at it, just like I look at my profession, I can tell you everything wrong. That's with whatever I put up. I'm pretty sure he might see something that's wrong. I, I see perfection. 
I see perfection in what you do. I see perfection in what Craig does. Uh, you know, I see all of this polished artwork that you guys do. I'm just blown away, especially by Miyazaki. Like I, I had heard that name before I started doing this podcast, and I was extremely ignorant when it came to his name. I knew of him. I knew the movies. I just never really watched them, watched them. It wasn't until COVID forcing everybody to kind of slow down and stop. Uh, you know, I, I sat down and I absorbed all this shit and I'm just blown away. And every time somebody comes and brings him up, I'm just amazed that not only does that man exist, but the team that he put to together to, to make these masterpieces is second to none in my opinion. But in my opinion, don't really mean shit, man. I'm just a fan. So, um, but getting back to you, uh, one yeah. thing I definitely did. What's that? I was going to say, yeah, anime wasn't, um, it, it wasn't as, as uh, much a part of the culture in America back then as it is now, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were some cool shows when I was a kid that uh, you had to be a real nerd to be into. Um, but like, what was that show? It was called Battle of the Planets. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm not, no. Um, I think I think the Japanese name was something like Starship Yamato or something like that. But it was um, I just remember the the thing about those uh, some of those Japanese shows that were were playing in America. Um, the drawings were amazing, but we didn't like the animation because they shot everything on threes instead of twos or something. Do you know what that means? I don't know. Um, so in other words, they would instead of. Uh, now I'm not I'm not an expert in, in how the technical stuff works with with animation and camera work, but basically they would they would uh, use the same drawing for two frames, okay, uh, or three frames rather than you know a drawing for every frame like Disney or would do for instance. So the so the animation always seemed a little more choppy, but they made up for it because the drawings were so much more amazing, yeah. you know. So. Yeah, that was always what stood out to me about that that art form when I was a kid, and now it's just kind of the standard, you know. I mean, that's what every that's what everybody's going for now. It's much more popular than ever. Dude, I I don't I. It's not that I don't understand it. It's just like I'm I'm blown away. Like growing up, it was Ed, Ed and Eddie. It was you know Curse Cowboy Dog, it's Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, Samurai Jack, and then I talked to like I said, I talked to my son. I'm um, like, what do the kids watch in school? He's like anime, and I was like is that it? And he's like, yeah, pretty much. And I was like, dude, when I was going yeah. to school, like you would get beaten up for like an anime. Like you were that weird anime kid. You were that weird comic book yeah. kid, You were that weird yeah. nerd. And now they it's were just... definitely the weirdest kids in the school, but yeah. you know, they, they all knew something we didn't apparently. <laughs> they, they really did because like I said, it was Dragon Ball Z, like Voltron at my time was probably the oldest anime. You, yeah. you throw Speed Racer in there, but I only saw Speed Racer a few times because they would play it at like three o'clock in the morning on Cartoon Network. You know, I was usually up around then anyways, because I've never been able to really sleep. Um, so I would catch it here and there, but I didn't seek it out. I seek, I seeked, that's the right word, right? Tense, whatever. I would seek out Voltron. I would seek out Dragon Ball Z. And then when I would bring up these shows to these kids that were the anime kids in school, trying to, you know, trying to get on their side and shit, trying to talk to them about the stuff they watched, they would tell you, oh, that's not real anime. You got to go watch this. You got to watch that. I'm like, dude, this isn't real anime, man. I don't, I don't know what fucking lane I'm supposed to be in. Yeah. So I threw it off, I threw it off to the side, and it wasn't until you know kid gets older and he starts. I think he started with Naruto when when COVID all hit and he got sent home too. You know his friends were all talking about Naruto because they're all in the Zoom chat or whatever, and they're supposed to be doing their schoolwork. They're really all watching fucking Netflix, you know. So it started with Naruto, and then it went to My Hero Academia, and then I started watching it with them because like I was like, I want to watch something with you, man. I want to connect with you, bond over, and. uh you know, so he'll pick out a new series. You know, he's like 50-50. Like, he'll pick out one good one, and then the next one is like, man, this is dog shit. I don't like this, man. This is boring as hell. He's like, man, you just don't know what you're talking about. I was like, yeah. he's like, you got to give My it some time. exactly the same way. Yeah, he's, he's uh, like, well, you got to give it 13 episodes. I was like, dude, I don't have time to give it two episodes. Yeah, meanwhile, they have literally a thousand episodes you can yeah. watch on yeah. some of these. Because they've been going for 30 years. Mm -hmm. There's this show called One Piece, right? I mean, yeah, I've never even heard of it before, but... um. And I'm I'm certainly dating myself by admitting that, but uh, yeah, my son's like, oh yeah, there's like forty seasons or some kind of crazy. And shit. they're still going. They're still going. Yeah, yeah. and it's more popular oh, yeah. than ever. You know, yeah. so you know, I guess I don't know. It's a new world, have, man. You're gonna have that anime around for at least another twenty five years because the manga is still going. He has no he has no insight 
or he has no end in sight. Um, mm-hmm. At least that's what I've heard on the streets. Um, but like I said, uh, rotating into to the this one when I when I scrolled down your resume, I told told you this earlier. When I saw Eight Crazy Nights pop up, I gotta say this was probably the last movie I got to rent from Blockbuster. Date myself here on that one. I'm not that old, but I'm pretty old. Um, this was like one of the last ones that I rented from Blockbuster because I'm a huge Adam Sandler fan. I love the movies he's putting on. Seeing this one, fucking fell out of my chair, out of my couch, at whatever it was, laughing so hard at this movie man uh is this one of those ones where you're just putting your feelers out there you're trying to get a job how does this one come about how does eight crazy nights come across you oh god i don't even know um all right so eight crazy nights was with sony Mm -hmm. and i had already that's the that's the company i had worked primarily for um i had worked at sony on as i said jumanji and then we moved that i I ended up moving on to the Dilbert series. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a whole nother thing we could talk about. Um, and when that finally wrapped up, uh, yeah, we were all kind of, it was kind of a big, there was a big town turn in the industry at the time. Um, it's, I feel like there was a downturn. Maybe it was later. Maybe that was after September 11th. But anyway, at that time for me, there was, there was just, uh, a big long hiatus going on. Like I didn't have any work, um, but I had friends who were work from Sony who got moved on to Sandler's thing. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to get in, in that way. I was able to actually get in um, relatively early doing visual development with a couple of great designers. Um, and I, uh, it's a funny story. There's a, so there's a guy named uh, Drew Gentle that I worked with who, was a mentor for me. His, I think his dad, Bob Gentle, was a pretty well-known uh, animation. I don't know if he was a designer or painter or what he was. Um, but Drew was a background designer, very talented, very professional. He was older than me. He was like in his 50s. Um, and his work was really, really tight and slick and beautifully presented. Like he just had that sort of polish to his stuff that just looked really presentable. Meanwhile, my my drawings always looked like dog shit until I finished them. You know, like he would just his sketches were amazing. And my yeah. sketches were just like, I mean, they're still gross. My sketches yeah. are still gross <laughs> to look at. And I mean, I mean, they're less gross now because I'm not smearing my hand all over the page with mm-hmm. graphite and stuff. Uh, but um, so we would present our work. Uh, we would put our work up on a board and Sandler and his entourage would walk past each guy's table. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the art director would be like, oh, and look what Drew did, blah, blah, blah. And he'd be like, oh, that's awesome. You know, and then they'd walk over to the next table. And I was like, oh, fuck. So so they they came to my table and the art director, it's Alan, it's 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 Sandler's guy. His name is Perry Blake, and he's worked on all his movies. Um, I think he directed that Master in Disguise movie. Mm. Perry did. With Dana Carvey? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, enough said about that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> nice guy. Um, so he introduced, he, he introduced me to Sandler and his guys and showed them the work. And my drawings next to Drew's stuff, like I said, looked like just, you know. Yeah. Um, it was all there. I mean, all the shapes were designed and everything was kind of figured out and stuff. They were well-designed shots. They just weren't finished. They were just roughs. And so they were, okay, thanks. And they moved on to the next guy. And I don't know if I even remember this correctly, but this is how I remember what happened next. Sandler, he hangs back for a second after everybody goes past. And he looks at me and he goes like this. And then he just turns around and goes. And I was like, did that just fucking happen? <laughs> it's so, so weird. And it's funny because I, I didn't get fired. I ended up getting promoted on the show. So I don't know. <laughs> I still to this day don't know what the fuck that was. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe it was his way of uh, motivating me. Like, maybe sure it was a joke. Here. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> and, you know, every time you... Every, you hear people talk about Stanley. He's like the greatest guy to work for, right? Yeah. Oh, he cares about his crew and all this stuff. I mean, he did. Like he 
he would pay for all kinds of cool stuff for everybody and and he was a great boss but just for that moment that day i don't know what the fuck was. <laughs> oh man uh but what anyway yeah the show was the show was it was uh yeah it was a it was a fun experience i i enjoyed working on it um i i met some great guys who are really top people in the business now who were just starting out back then um and santa would bring his dog meatball around he had a bulldog at the time yeah. and everybody loved him yeah it was from little nicky that's the same uh same same bulldog from little nicky he had in there yeah. uh, that was meatball um was this one done traditionally or was this one done uh on on tablets computers whatever it might have been uh, we were um, still all working in paper then. yeah so uh, the transition was happening yeah um, so this one was done on cells like the uh the the painting was all done digitally as i recall mm -hmm. they finished like they i don't know what happened on that show but they had to cut costs or whatever right in the middle of production and, and a lot of people got let go early and they moved the whole production over to warner brothers studios mm -hmm. and they they hired a guy who's like a real hatchet man who uh knew how to keep costs down and uh and they just finished it the best way they could over there and it, it turned out pretty well all things oh, considered i enjoyed the hell of it i wonder if it was around that time warner merger um when cartoon network Hanna barbera all that shit's happening aol um uh, yeah i don't know i don't know when when all that but i mean it was sony pictures and then they farmed it out to warner brothers animation yeah. to finish it yeah that's interesting uh they just had the 20th anniversary for eight crazy yeah. nights yeah yeah, it, it's been 20 years. I, I I rented it for my kid to watch the other day. He couldn't believe what he was watching. <laughs> really? Oh, does it still hold? I haven't watched it in a few years. Last time I um, watched it. You know what still holds up? I mean, I don't know, man. I know you say Sandler is like one of your favorite. I just, I don't know. I did see him at college once. He played my college when I was a kid. Yeah. And he was he was nobody then. And he was he was pretty funny stand-up. Um. But yeah, I don't know. I I just I don't get Santa. <laughs> he's, he's he's like that. But, but what I will say is that th what really holds up and for me is uh, the songs in that movie. Yes, those are great songs. I, I there's not. I'd have to go back. Like I said, I have not seen it probably three four years. Um, I I, I remember putting it on and then uh, my son was watching it and he was shit man maybe like nine or eight and you know it's it's weird when you look back and you see some of the movies you saw at around the same age you're showing your kids but this is such a different generation it's such a different time and i'm looking i'm like man i probably shouldn't be showing this this, this guy's talking about fucking his car and drinking and driving and i was like maybe i shouldn't be doing this to a nine-year-old just yet and then i go on and put on like something like happy gilmore or or you know water boy hey. or billy madison i'm like this is the same fucking thing it's just at least the cartoon is not as believable as live action but yeah man sandler was i love his movies and i love uh what i, what I love about it is because he's definitely a generational talent because my whole generation loves them, right? And then the younger generation loves them because they're getting to see. It's like Ice Cube, right? My kid comes home, uh, the rapper. My kid comes home one time and he's like, Dad, I heard all these people saying Ice Cube is a rapper. Is he a rapper? And I was like, well, yeah, he's a rapper. Like, what do you know him from? He's like, are we there yet? And all these other movies that he's seen. He's like, he's an actor, though. And I was like, yeah, well, you can be more than two things. So he was like, well, can you play you know, some of his music? And I'm like not really <laughs> i was like oh yeah i can play some of his music oh, okay. and well uh so i don't know how versed you are with hip-hop i love hip-hop I, I, just the hip-hop history and all One that the original founding members of nwa, MWA. Right? yeah uh you know him easy -E, you know dr dre you know you had a couple other guys in there as well dj ren um but i love that whole era that's my favorite era of music whether it's hip-hop r&b i love the grunge era i just love that era of music yeah. um and so boys guy when i was a kid dude i love the fucking beastie boys uh that one when mca passed away man that one tore me up so fucking bad uh because they were working on a new album at that time and yeah. uh, speaking of beast boys did you see their um i don't know if you have apple tv plus or whatever the fuck it's called yeah there was a uh, documentary right i forget dude, what it was called so good uh they, shit. Were on, they were on live on stage reminiscing yeah yeah, yeah. it's and then if you listen to any podcast, there's a podcast that's called The Last Podcast on the Left. They do all these weird, like, kooky um, – what are they – so some of the topics they'll cover, they'll cover um, 
they'll cover what's that weird fucker for scientology um ron l hubbard they, they have a whole series about him and they talk about how scientology came out and ron l hubbard and then they'll talk about this axe murder it's just a weird fucking podcast but they had this offshoot of one and it's called no dogs in space and uh they do an entire thing on the beastie boys i think it's like four parts so it's like four hours total um and you can find it on on spotify or whatever but it's phenomenal they do the same thing that the beastie boys are doing for that that live documentary but they're going into way more detail because they're just they're from the first inception of the beastie boys when they started out as punk rock and an mca yeah. came in and all these guys so they tell the complete history of the beastie boys it's a phenomenal podcast and it's just called uh no dogs in space and then beastie boys doc or whatever it's called um but yeah i'm a huge what's your favorite beastie boy song oh god i don't know man i've been listening to hello nasty lately mm -hmm. uh yeah um, there's i can't believe how many there's a lot of songs that you could probably just get rid of but you know which one i really love listening to and i i i only heard it recently and i just started playing it over and over again it was a song called i don't know mm -hmm. do you know that one I, I don't know. It's uh, not even a rap song. It's just really, it's really just a beautiful song. I'll have to check that one out after uh, we get off. Paul Revere, Licensed Ill. It's such a cop-out album because it's a near perfect, I'm mean, not a near perfect, it's a perfect album for me, but Licensed Ill and then Paul Revere is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the easy time. answer, right? That I is. Favorite oh, yeah. Song. Well, if we're being honest, the first BC Boy song I ever heard was No Sleep Till Brooklyn, and I saw that in Above uh -huh. the Law with steven seagal i'm a huge steven oh. seagal fan too so i got to i got to experience a lot of those those corny 80s action movies and then that was how they opened up that movie I'm like what the fuck is what the fuck is no sleep till brooklyn what is this is before apple you can go and buy it and spotify this this is like vhs shit and i'm seeing this dude break this dude's arm over his shoulder i was like this is the coolest fucking thing in the world and this has got the coolest soundtrack in the world so yeah i mean i've been a, i've been a real fan a uh, real big fan since I was a little guy, uh, but staying on eight crazy nights for just a little bit, man. Uh, so what were what were some of your favorite scenes and settings to work on in this one? You got any that stick out or any memorable other than the <laughs> thumbs down from old Sandler there? You got anything that sticks out as far um, as the production goes? As far as the work itself? Mm -hmm. I mean, not really. Um, I try to stay away from that type of question because I mean, it's such a long we, time ago. I was just following Drew's lead as much as I could. And then I ended up becoming his boss, which was weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, there was, there was a lot of, a lot of cool settings like, like Whitey's house with mm -hmm. all the crazy decorations and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I liked designing Davy's trailer in the snow and, you know, but you know, there was so much collaboration on that. I don't even know how much of that stuff was mine. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, like I said, man, it was uh, it's really fun. I try to stay away from questions like that because, like I said, it's such a long time ago. It's hard to remember what you yeah, did yeah. six months ago, let alone twenty plus years ago. Um, but like I said, that one probably the last movie I rented from from Blockbuster. Um, a couple of the other ones you you worked on, and then we'll rotate into some uh, some of the questions I've got written down here. Um, I told you I'm a huge Scooby Doo fan, man. Uh, Mystery Incorporated was one you worked on quite extensively. Um, what was your ever, in my opinion? What's that? The best incarnation of Scooby Doo they've ever done, in my opinion, including the original. And cool. Ooh. Maybe I'm being a little bit biased, right? Because oh, it was yeah. <laughs> roll these sleeves up real quick, Chris. I would love <laughs> to know why. I it's not that I don't agree with you. I love this one. Uh, I think. Um, it's one of those ones when you go back, especially with, have you seen Velma? Uh, I saw about four minutes of the first episode. Man, you lasted a lot quicker than I did. I made it all the way to like the last seven minutes and I was like, maybe this gets better. Maybe this gets better. The one thing that I can say, cause what I, what I hate doing is I hate shitting on something. Cause I can, and, and I, I know a lot of do. great people who worked on it too. But that's the only thing that I can say that I, I enjoyed about that show um, was the animation. The animation was absolutely beautiful. The colors they used. I mean, uh, one of the coolest things I saw was that whole when she's getting possessed of so that hand coming up, that whole sequence of I can't think of how they worded it, but it's essentially like she's being possessed or she's talking. She's seeing these premonitions. So that whole weird dreamscape thing that you see was fascinating and the animation style was gorgeous like i said the colors and everything it's just they took characters that i absolutely loved and shit on them 
defecated all over the cast. I'm just like, dude, come on. Dude, you guys, you guys had something. The the idea, the initial concept was pretty cool. Okay, let me give me give me a Rick and Morty, but Scooby Doo, right? And then you get it, and you're like, not one of these characters you like. Every you hate everybody. Everybody sucks. Yeah. And like I said, the I, I hate I hate it's shitting. Hard to imagine that it wasn't intentional, in my opinion. I really think it was. It's like let's just break the third wall. Let's just be meta on the sake of being meta. But nonetheless, man, I don't want to shit on too many things because, like I said, I can't do what you guys. <laughs> I can't do what you guys do. Uh, that'd be like somebody coming in my restaurant, and they do it all the, the time. The good thing is, is that that show helped pay a lot of people's mortgages. So I'm glad it did that because it's it hmm. definitely didn't pay my soul in any dividends for Scooby Doo. <laughs> that I love, man. Uh, but Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated, man. Uh, like I said, I don't I don't know how how deep you go as far as the Scooby Doo mythos goes, uh, but for me, man, this was one of the the cornerstones of my child. I can imagine it's pretty pretty sure it's yours too. As a cornerstone of my childhood, I mean. I'm, you can remember Bugs Bunny and Daffy and Foghorn and all these other guys. Everybody knows Scooby Doo. Scooby Doo's as transcendent as Mickey Mouse and Coca Cola and Homer Simpson and Batman. Um, what was your uh, what was your time like on Scooby Doo, man? How fun was it for you? The most fun I ever had in a job. I think. Yeah, right on. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, when you when you take a job in this business or any business, mm -hmm. um, most of the fun you have is determined by the people you work with, not by anything else. It's Absolutely. Not I mean, you could have the worst fucking job on earth, but if you got a great crew of people with you, it's great. You look forward yeah. to going to work, you know, shoveling shit all day or whatever you do, got <laughs> doing for a living. Absolutely. Um, and that's what Scooby was for me. Uh, so I, I had made friends with a guy named Bill Flores at Cartoon Network. Because he was he was very good friends with um, somebody who was a mentor to me on on Teenage Robot, Joseph Holt, super talented designer. Um, and uh, Bill was going over to Scooby Doo at Warner Brothers, and and he told the art director about me, and I don't even think I took a test. Dan was just Dan Crawl was the art director at the time, and and he just was like, well, all right, you're in. <laughs> so. Uh, um, so between Dan and Bill and we had, uh, my friend Sana Hong and we had Sue Mont at some point, my friend Jerry Richardson, who I had mentioned earlier was on the show, um, and a bunch of other people I'm forgetting to mention, uh, my friend Steve Nicodemus, uh, we just had a great time. We just enjoyed each other's company. Yeah. Playing pranks on each other having cocktails every Thursday we did. I think Sana got us to do something called fancy Fridays where we all, we, you know, remember Mad Men? Remember the show? Yes. Mad Men? Yeah. So that was all the rage while we were making the show. And so we all decided to dress up in suits on Friday and have, and go to lunch and order martinis and stuff. So that's what we did every Friday for a while. It was great. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I, I really like that. Uh... And the show is fun. And Dan's a great boss. Dan's a, Dan's a, uh, if you ever uh, get a chance to have him on, I recommend that highly. Dan Crawl. I know, I know Dan. I, I mean, I don't know Dan quite well, but I've reached out a couple times and uh, I know he's seen my messages, but uh, what I've learned from the Samurai Jack guys, uh, Samurai Jack uh, guys, and that's where I know Dan from. Dan's worked on so many things. Um, you know, Scott Wills is another one. Uh, you know, Derek Bachman, another one. Very, very shy I, I think is the word i keep hearing with these guys a lot of these guys it's very hard to get some people to talk about themselves for so long a lot of people have issues with it they just don't want to seem like they did more than anybody else i hear that one a lot um craig kelman's another one that it's like uh you know I, he's like it was a team it was like i don't want to just make it sound like it was just me but i was like this is what i love about these these things because there's so many times that folks like you chris or folks like dan or scott or, you know, if it's not the big guy like Gendy or Craig, you know, very rarely is somebody going around and asking a storyboard artist, a painter, uh, a fucking in-betweener, like, hey, man, what was your what was the time like on Samurai Jack or Powerpuff Girls or X, Y, and Z? And that's why I do this podcast, because I love talking to everybody that had something to do with the shit that I love, which is animation, which pop culture, comic books. If you were a fucking letter at Marvel, I'm pretty sure you got some cool fucking stories. 
I want to hear them because you yeah, got right. lived a different life than I had. You know what I mean? So it's just, there's so many facets to, to animation. And I love talking to everybody that wants to be on. Um, but yeah, man, I, I've, I've been following Dan for quite some time. The Samurai Jack, I, I, I've said this so many times, ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize. That show in particular, I could not appreciate when I was 12 years old when I saw it the first time. Could not appreciate it. If I ever said that I appreciated Samurai Jack at 12 years old, I wish I could get into DeLorean and kick myself in the nuts at 12 years old. Couldn't do it. It wasn't until we had our second child back in 2021 where every night I was watching an episode, wife would get in the shower, I would have the baby. She would get out. I would give her the baby. I'd get in the shower and I'm watching an episode or two of Samurai Jack at night. And I'm blown away every single time I see it. It's just I've rewatched that series four, five, six times now. Blown away every time. And like I said, Dan was a big part of that one. You had all of those guys that I mentioned too. Um, so yeah, those that was my little spiel on all of those guys, man. It's just fucking perfect show. Anyways. I think I was a little bit long-winded there, Chris, so I apologize. But like I said, man, it's uh, those guys are great. And, you know, you echoed yeah. that. So you, had no, you had no response from him, huh? All right. Uh, well, no, I've talked to him here and there. But, like, whenever I throw the oh, okay. uh, throw it out there, whenever I throw it out there, I always comment whenever he posts a new picture or anything like that. Yeah, just, some, like, really cool. So Some artists in this business, they're sort of like, I don't know, like unicorns or something. You know what I mean? They're just sort oh, yeah. of these elusive unique creatures that are hard to get hold of oh man boy oh boy are they but like i said i love talking to the people that i have on man because if i if i ever reach out to someone, i don't ever reach out to anybody and say hey i want you to come on and i just blow smoke up your ass if i reach out and i ask like hey i would love for you to come on and talk it's because i really enjoy what you did you whatever you did you elicited some kind of feeling like i told you at the beginning of the show man your backgrounds made me start looking at backgrounds so much more in depth i'll pause scenes just to see what's in the background because of your work, man. Um, and if I ever ask anybody on, it's because I thoroughly enjoy what you guys do. Um, so, yeah. And uh, I figure what we can do now, because we've been going for a little over an hour now, um, is we can rotate into some fans' questions. However, uh, if you ever want to, I'd love to have you come back on, because there's no way we could do your entire career. We couldn't even do a tenth of your career in just this short hour. You know, I jumped around a little bit because I want to hit a little bit for each thing you worked on. Um you know, so I, I really enjoy that. Uh, but what, uh, one more question before we return to the fans' questions. Uh, Scooby Doo, what was your favorite thing that you got to draw? I got to imagine, like I said, growing up with Scooby Doo as a kid, you probably had a favorite episode as a kid, but did you get to put anything that you absolutely wanted to get into Scooby Doo? Did, did you get to do anything that you really wanted to do? You mean like Easter eggs and stuff? Easter I mean, eggs, or if there was a character, if there was a design that you absolutely loved, a background you loved from the original show uh, that you wanted to put into this well, new reincarnation. That was, that was more my friend Bill's job. He was mm -hmm. always putting his own little personal inside jokes yeah. into backgrounds and stuff, and stuff that maybe even could have gotten fired, but nobody ever noticed. I won't even mention what, what some of them were, but anyway, yeah, that was Bill's thing. Uh. Let me see. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I just enjoyed the genre. I just yeah. enjoyed that all the episodes had um, just really great settings to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was like a crazy haunted amusement park or, or uh, you know, and especially toward the end of the season when it started getting really freaky, geeky, supernatural. Um, like in the third, is it the third season? Where where it's like it's no more a question of are these kids just kind of unmasking just regular folks or is I mean, this I, I hate to spoil it for the people who haven't seen seen it but yeah it, all that stuff ends up being like all the conspiracies are real yeah. you know, by the end of the show and, and th that was stuff was pretty fun drawing like interdimensional gateways and all kinds of crazy shit so were you were you uh, sober under the influence? Because I've always liked that question. Because me, I like to partake in weed quite often. Now, if we can avoid this question, if you want to, no problem. But I, I enjoy weed. It puts me in a different headspace. It definitely makes me drop any kind of preconceived notions that I might have of whatever situation I'm going through. So especially when I want to be artistic, when I want to be, you know, uh, just fun and playful and crafty, especially in a kitchen, handful of edibles. 30 minutes later, I'm in a good, I'm in a good third, fourth, fifth, sixth dimension, man. But when you're trying to come up with something like that, you know, do you have to be sober? Are you a guy that I, likes to experiment a little bit? I can't say that that is part of my process. No, no? I, I, I really, to be honest, I don't even know if I've ever 
drawn under the influence. I don't know if I ever have. No. Um. I mean, maybe in college. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. It's. I mean, I used there's there's a. I mean, I I remember uh, when I first got into this business, I had a friend, um, who I met actually before I got into the a guy named Jim Janes, and he was a, he was a, comic book artist who worked uh for many years in new york and worked in i think he uh i think he drew the legion of superheroes for a while but anyway um i met him out here i was a friend of his was teaching like some kind of continuing ed course or something about comic books and i had a, like a little weird character that i was trying to see if i could do something with and jim spoke at the class and we became friends and i used to go over his house and he'd be storyboarding for spider-man yeah and this guy would just like He'd be baked the entire time I knew him, you know. <laughs> it's just like even even when I and I, I finally ended up getting a job at Sony, and he was working at Sony on on uh, I don't know what he was working on, maybe Ghostbusters or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, these guys were out in the car on their lunch hour, you know. That's just how they got through the day. But that was never anything I needed to do. No, so, it, like I said, it's always interesting, especially when you start. I think it's also maybe a different generation, too. Like, these guys were all a few years older than me. I don't really see a lot of that now, but now everybody's working at home. So who knows what people are doing on their own time? It, it, it's it's always interesting because you hear stories, not not so much about animation, but I, like I said, we have the we have the, the comic book connection here for a second. Um, I don't know if you ever read it, but Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison. You, you remember that one? Uh, did it come out after 1990? Yes, I think it was probably about the time i stopped reading comic books oh shit okay if you get the chance man you should really check it out it's yeah. very very psychedelic right it's it's take take dr strange at its height and then warp it to joker right so it's it's all about that i don't want to i don't want to spoil anything but if you get the chance to read it check it out but yeah i've heard of it i've heard of the series oh it is really good and the artwork is what's crazy about it and they were talking about like they wouldn't start writing or drawing or you know, doing anything with the story until about two o'clock. And I want to say Grant had said, you know, he was taking psychedelics at that time to put him in this weird Grant Morrison. Um, he was, it okay. put him in this weird headspace. He's the Scottish writer um, out of, well, out of Scotland, but does DC. Uh, he was, he, I, I believe he created Damian Wayne, which is, uh, you know, obviously Bruce and Talia al Ghul's kid. Um, you know, so it's uh, Grant Morrison created, I believe Grant Morrison created that guy. Or that kid. Um, but it's a very good story and it was really, really weird. And that was like the first time I ever heard anybody about going, they'd stay up all day, all into the night, and then they would just either drop acid and if it's not acid, Grant, I'm sorry, don't sue me. Uh, you know, edibles. It was a shit ton of drugs that would just really alter, you know, his reality, and that's how he got this beautiful book. Um, so like I said, I like asking well, questions. I've, like I've heard the guys on Ren and Stimpy, that's pretty much how they came up with their plot lines too. I wouldn't be surprised. I I'm I don't want to shit on Ren and Stimpy because there's so many people that listen to the show that like that show. It's just not for me. Uh, I tried getting into it. I've tried so many times. I just can't. I don't know what it is. I just can't get into it. You know. Um, yeah. At I mean, the it's, time it came out, it was groundbreaking. It was filling a space that people were people my age who grew up on all the Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry mm -hmm. and stuff. We were kind of like missing that stuff, and it yeah. was. It was it if like I said, it filled that space for us, but it did it in a unique and new way that was kind of outrageous and 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 appropriate for let's say our age group at that point. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I tried watching it. The closest thing I could get to that that style was probably Rocco's Modern Life. Um it wasn't as 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 fucking, you know, gross and weird as, as Ren and Stimpy was. But it was like it was like Ren and Stimpy light when it came to that weird gross ups and shit like that with Rocco. Yeah. Um, but it was just something I, I don't know what it was like. I, I tried when I was a kid. I tried as a teenager. I've tried as an adult. I tried six months ago because people I tell it. I say it all the time. It's like it's, it's just not for me. And they're like, oh, just give it another shot. And I've done it sober. I've done it stoned. I just like ah, I, try, I, I don't I understand why people like it. I get it. It's the same thing with when when we talk the NBA. I love my magic. I don't like Kobe Bryant because he took my chances of winning, not my chances, our chances for Orlando for winning a title. I understand his importance. Very sad that he's gone and, his, and everybody else that died on that plane or that helicopter, excuse me. But it's just like it's the same concept. I can't really root for him as a former 
player because he took our chance of a championship. Same thing with Renda Snippy. It's just certain things are out there for me and it's not for me. Um, I've tried it multiple cases. I've probably tried watching Renda Snippy more than anything else I've tried. I'm not, I'm not sure if I could watch it nowadays either. It was just kind of like lightning in a bottle at the time, I think. Yeah, well, you could see, kind of see that and draw the same correlation in today's animation for adults. There's there's stuff out there for adults, but up until recently, it's, there wasn't really anything that a lot of adults could get behind. Obviously, Rick and Morty is a, I don't want to say yeah. a flash in the pan in the wrong way, but Rick and Morty was like every adult was talking about that one. But I, I really feel like the adult animated, you know, genre, I guess, is so under underserved. Um, and that's what I kind of see Ren and Stimpy as this early day yeah older than teenager type of things going into that adulthood kind of yeah. served well, that crowd also very subs kind of uh what's the word i was looking for not subservient very sub oh, god I, I can't think of a word um but it was it was sort of like an underground kind of a sensibility in a way like yeah. a revolutionary sort of under the radar Punk rock-esque kind of um sorry anyway Oh, no, you're perfectly fine, man. It was very punk rock, man. It, it spoke to a generation. It was like MTV for the MTV kids, man. Um, Subversive. So, that's the word I was looking for. Which which word? Subversive. That's Subversive. That's that's a good word, man. That's a good sub word to have right there. Um, but like I said, Chris, I've had a lot of fun doing this chat, man. Anytime you want to come back on, I'd love to have you back on. And we could talk more in detail about some of the other shows we just could not get to. Um, so those, we're going to start off with those first two questions that I gave you, man. Uh, who's on your Mount Rushmore? Doesn't have to be animators, illustrators, backgrounds, painters, anything like that. It could be anybody that's influenced you in your entire career. You get four plus an honorable mention. Okay. Well, um, I was trying to jot some names down while I was talking to you. Um, I think I mentioned Frank Frazetta. Mm -hmm. Conan. He was always very influential. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, I used to, this is not, I don't think there's a thing anymore. It hasn't been for a long time, but back when kids, we're really into the, the the hair bands, the heavy metal hair bands and stuff. Um, and we all wore denim jackets and we used to have our our favorite album covers painted on the backs of our jackets. That's not really a thing anymore, right? They do um, they do this patches now. I've seen a lot of uh, I started to see the jean jacket patches come back. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's it'll, maybe it'll come back, but it was a cool phenomenon back then. So that was how I made a little money as a as a kid in high school. I would I would paint album covers on kids denim jackets and uh there was there was an album that had the most amazing artwork on it was a couple of albums and it was it was a band that i didn't even like called molly hatchet have <laughs> you seen those album covers yes they're frank frazetta's artwork really and I didn't... um and before i knew who frank frazetta was i i saw this artwork on these album covers and i was like this is fucking awesome so mm -hmm. that's what i painted on my jacket you know not even knowing who the hell Frank Frazetta was. But uh, then I, you know, once I knew who he was, I came to really appreciate his work. Um, so I would put him up there um, as very influential on me. I would also put a guy named uh, Maurice Noble up there. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a yes, well-known uh, Looney, Tunes. Looney Tunes guy, Merry mm -hmm. Melodies guy, um, who's responsible for a lot of the stuff that, that uh, Chuck Jones did. Um, and, uh, just, I, his book is amazing. That came out a few years ago. You asked me if there's any books I would recommend. There's one called the noble approach, mm -hmm. um, which is all about background design. Um, and I would highly recommend that to anybody who's looking to get into that, that field. Um, as I mentioned, Steve Myers, I'd put up there, uh, my first mentor in the business. I couldn't leave out Craig McCracken, obviously. Um, just, I mean, the guy's, you know, he's Craig McCracken, what can I say? Oh, yeah. You know, he, he pretty, guy pretty much made my career, you know. So um, anytime he ever needs any work, I'm always, you know, dropping everything to do it for him. Uh, is that four? How many have I got left? Uh, I, th I think that might be, you That's said Maurice Noble. You said uh, Steve Myers. You said Craig McCracken. You said Frank Frazetta. So I think you get one more. Uh, but before you answer that one, what are the chances that you're working with Craig on Powerpuff Girls? Has he reached out? Obviously, if you can't say anything, we can skip over that. But I would love to see your backgrounds on the Powerpuff Girls. Um, We've had discussions. <laughs> I can't wait. Say say no more. 
Yeah. I really hope that comes to fruition, man. Yeah, we'll see. And then uh, you get an honorable mention. Who's on your honorable mention? Uh, I guess I would put my friend Jerry Richardson on there. Yeah. And Jerry was an amazing designer, but he was even a, a better man, in my mm -hmm. opinion. It's just, just everybody called him Uncle Jerry. He's just a, a special dude to know. Yeah. And uh, his passing was just a big loss for the business. And obviously everybody who knew him, so... What's your favorite Jerry story, Uncle Jerry story? You got one? Um, well, you know, I really don't think I have any stories in particular. It's just that whenever you saw Jerry, he was just in a great mood. Yeah. He was always happy to see you, and he was always ex super excited about what you were doing and asking always about you, you know, and, and, uh, when we went to his memorial a few years ago, um, I guess he must have had a motto that he had gone by because they were printed on little cards everywhere. And it was, and it just said, it was just a kind of a, Jerry, Jerry's private work was a lot like a, sort of like a Keith Haring kind of a style where he'd do these like real simple characters and stuff on big canvases. And um, he did like just a heart in that style and, and this motto was love is real. Mm -hmm. So, and I still have it hanging up on my on my door, but uh, yeah, he was he was a good guy, Jerry. Anyway, <laughs> sorry to bring bring the mood no. down a little bit. No, no, no. I uh, whenever whenever somebody that has left an impression or a mark on animation, because obviously I do an animation podcast or a pop culture podcast, or left a mark on my guests i've done it so many times i've done it with um james avery obviously the guy that played you know uncle phil and the voice of the original shredder is no longer here um you know and we do it with tuck tucker quite a few times tuck tucker i don't know if you ever got to work with him or you know him um legendary storyboard artist man and he's come up quite a few times and anytime that i get to sit back and say, Hey, what was your favorite story about a friend or a colleague that you guys absolutely had, you know, so much fun being around and being with, and then we could, you know, tell a story or we can tell, you know, what that person was like outside of their drawing board or outside of their script writing or outside of whatever they did for a day to day. And we really get to paint a picture of what that person was, is, and still continues to be to so many people. Uh, I really like to take a moment and just paint that picture for somebody. Cause I think it's something special. And I think it's something that uh, can stand the test of time when we can sit there and say, whether well, we're tipping our caps to somebody that pushed innovation and pushed animation, you know, a little bit further, or like I said, had an impact in your life. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy being able to highlight the folks that are no longer here because I think it's something that's, uh, that's needed in our day to day. Um, so our next question. Uh, so you did the the one. The first one was that noble approach, which I wrote I wrote down. Um, I'm a huge Maurice Noble fan. I didn't even know the book was out. Um, what was that other book that you would recommend? You get two of those recommendations that if you're a fan of animation, everybody in animation should have on their bookshelves. Um, well, oddly enough, uh, another book that I referred to a lot is a book that's kind of for kids. It's mm -hmm. um. It's How to Draw the Marvel Way. How oh, to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. Do you know that book? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think I, I actually saw that book until after I I uh, was already out in California. Um, but, you know, the, the artists that are featured in that book were guys that I just adored growing up. Uh, John Buscema, I think, did all the illustrations for that book. Um, and he was he was on Conan the Barbarian for years and years and years. That was my Silver Surfer book. as well. Yeah. Um, but it's just such a, a simple, uh, straightforward and fun approach to uh, just drawing in general and drawing mm -hmm. comic books in particular that I think it's just it's uh, it's just a it's just a great resource for anybody. Absolutely. Uh, this is my second office. Essentially, we took my last office and then turned it into a nursery upstairs. So I haven't brought all of my books down. So I've got that book somewhere upstairs and in, in my closet up there. Um, that was one of the first ones I bought. That one, I think uh, Stan did the how to write Marvel comics or how to write comics the Marvel way. I think Stan wrote one, uh, wrote one, even though, you know, um, I think it was two in that set. It was how to draw the Marvel way and then how to write the Marvel way. Um, so the next one, these are, these are really fun. 
uh, because how I got to you was because of Craig. How I got to you was because of Paula Spence dropping your name as well. Um, so this is the animation recommendation, man. Is there a person out there that you think would have a great time on this podcast that we should reach out to? This is who you get to uh, recommend. Yeah, I, I know a few people. Um, yeah. Well, let's see. I, I mentioned Dan Crawl. Uh, you've probably heard the name Alex Kerwin. Yes, I have. Um, I don't know how easy he is to get a hold of. Uh, another guy who I think would be great would be a guy named Ben Balistrieri. Ben Balistrieri. Amazing character designer. Um, mostly known for character designer, but he's he can do it all. Mm -hmm. um, Shannon, uh, Shannon Tyndall would be a great get. Beautiful. We'll he's uh, he wrote. Um, he's a he's a storyboarder, director. Actually, mostly director now, director and writer. Um, and he uh, he was directing. He wrote and directed up into a point. Uh, Kubo and the Two Strings, Three Strings. I forget the name of the movie. That sounds vaguely familiar. You know that animated one about the the Japanese kid. That 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 first name it sounds so familiar. I'm pretty ah. sure it's Kubo and the Two Strings, but I might be wrong. Um. But yeah, that's a that's a whole story in itself. He um. He had a he had a situation where he he ended up not directing a movie that he wrote. <laughs> And it was very personal to him, but he's, 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 uh, he's gotten way past that at this point. He's a very successful guy, but, um, just a wonderful creative source. Beautiful. Uh, I got those names written down. Also, do you, have you heard the name Tara Billinger or, or Zach, uh, Bellissimo? These are two huh. friends of mine that, um, I met Tara at Disney and she, uh, she was a character designer on Mickey Mouse mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but they, they ended up, um, doing a Kickstarter and funding their own cartoon. They just yeah. made their own cartoon and they made a pilot put on YouTube. It's called, uh, Long Gone Gulch. Yeah. And, uh, I think it's at like 3 million views right now. And they, they, wow. they, they love talking to people and, and they're just a lot of fun to talk to. Um, yeah, I was able to do some toys with them actually. Um, and we're planning on doing another one at some point. Dude, that's that's pretty dope. I I'm glad you brought up your your 3D printing, um, because I I think Craig had shared it. What what you do was it uh Papa G or shit? What you do from Kid Cosmic? It was Papa G, wasn't it? The one yeah. you said, Craig. Yeah, yeah, that was. I, also did, a, I did a sculpt of tuna sandwich too. That's my favorite character in the show. I I love like, I think Craig and I talked about it. Um, shit, was it? Oh no, tuna sandwich or two senses danger something along those lines i'd have to go back and look at the lines it's essentially when he first gets the gym and then his eyes go real wide and then his yeah, tongue yeah, yeah. Starts well that's going. what the sculpture is it's him and his like third eye mode. third eye <laughs> dude my, um, my we saw that my son got because my my son uh wanted a cat um when he was younger so we got him a little kitten and everything so he, he fucking loves the cat he's got the cat we have uh we call it the governor her real name is raven but uh she walks around the house like she's presidential and shit and if you're sitting there because i for a lot of times i would get home and everybody would already eat dinner so i would go and you know eat dinner by myself so she would come over we have this table and then we have this like bench thing where it's you know down on the ground and stuff so she would sit on top of the bench and just like look at you while you eat so you didn't eat alone um so anytime we would see tuna fish that's who it would remind us of is our cat raven because she had she couldn't see the future and shit she had a lot of the same weird ass tendencies and shit you know <laughs> So we we that was our favorite character in that entire show. It was just, just the sun and the voice that was chosen for Tuna was fucking yeah. amazing. I, I character the guy's name, um, but he's also the guy who does uh, Yosemite Sam now. Really, I, he always had a Walter yeah, Brimley I, type I, of yeah, voice. Name. I, I met him at the at the rap party. Nice fellow. Yeah, um, it's, it's a distinguished voice, uh, fantastic voice. Oh, so you mentioned those those three D sculpts of those characters, and oddly enough, um, Craig has an upcoming show at a place called Gallery Nucleus down here mm -hmm. uh, in May, in early May, and he asked me if I would put the sculptures in the show. 
Oh, that's so cool. So there's going to be four of my my 3D printed sculptures at, at Craig's solo art show coming up. So the place is called Gallery Nucleus. It's on May 6th, if anybody's interested. Uh, what is today? You know what is that? I think a... the opening is on the thirteenth, but the but the show starts on the sixth. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is is we'll we'll get this episode out right before it starts, and we'll put all of those links into it. Um, cool. your three D sculpting. We'll do the gallery nucleus, and then anything else you want, just send us a link, and we'll put that in the show notes and description, so people can point click go straight to it. Um, I because I I I really enjoy the uh, sculpting. Um. When he posted that picture on Twitter, I was fucking blown away by the level of detail. Like I'm, I'm a. Let me just one second. I'll show you. Um, I don't buy too many statues, too many sculptures, and shit like that. There's only a few that I like find, and mainly I'm following specific artists. Make sure I don't drop this shit. I family moved my stuff down here and almost dropped half of my shit. Now, obviously, we're not talking. We're talking superheroes and villains now. But I've, I've only started buying statues and shit recently and you're a comic book guy so you might be able to appreciate this but this deathstroke one right mm -hmm. it's uh i was only buying jim lee i'm a huge jim lee fan i don't, I don't know if you remember yeah, yeah. um in my opinion it does not get any better than in him as, as far as artists go um so i was you only like john romita jr what's that do you like john romita jr's work oh how do i say this delicately yes and no uh i I'm not the biggest Superman fan. Yeah, he's, he's Superman. It was very blocky. I like his dad better than I liked him. Uh -huh. Um, but it, it's crazy oh. because his covers are his. Oh, I'm gonna shit on this guy. His covers are ugly because of his blocky yeah. style. His, his his covers are very very not for me. I don't want to say ugly because I can't do what he does. Oh. Um, but his interiors are beautiful. They're not as blocky as like. Yeah, yeah. I I just don't understand it. I don't like his covers. I like his dad's yeah. covers more. The reason I mention him is um, he was actually somebody I met when I was a kid um, because he lived in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. He was 25 years old at the time. His roommate was a cop or something. And my brother's best friend was his paper boy. Yeah. And so he's like, Chris, did you know that there's a comic book artist on my route? You want to meet him? <laughs> and so like, yeah, I walked into John Romita Jr.'s studio and I showed him my shitty drawings and and uh it was cool you know just seeing seeing all that stuff I was like wow maybe i could do something like this someday um but he's like yeah i just remember him the only thing he said to me was work on your anatomy so, <laughs> he's yeah. one to talk because he drew superman so fucking block like i said <laughs> i love his interiors just what he did i'm not yeah. the biggest superman fan so it didn't really hurt my feelings but i believe it was scott snyder and and john romita jr but it might have just been john romita jr scott snyder is my favorite writer of all time um when it comes to to superhero or to comic books but uh it's just his his style of superman was so blocky and squared and it just fucking hated it man it's just like but his interiors were yeah. beautiful so there you know it's, there's that it's funny sometimes artists do things that that are new and nobody likes them because it's just different you know and they don't it's something you just can't you just can't wrap your head around I mean, and I, maybe sometimes it takes time and sometimes you get used to it and you start to appreciate it, or sometimes you just never do you're just like just i've still got it i've got it I'm, i probably have it sitting out because it was um the magazine format for so they started doing these um black label is what they're called from dc so it's the more adult version of comics and shit. So you're seeing like Joker eviscerate people and stuff. So it's, it's pretty gruesome stuff. I believe it was, I don't know. I don't know if it was a part of the black label, but it was the magazine format that from the eighties. If you remember the first uh, Ninja Turtle comic, it was that magazine format. It was like 13 by four, or whatever it was uh, yeah. as far as the format goes. Um, so I had to, it doesn't fit in my long boxes at all. I mean, I've got fucking 12 of them over here sitting just stocked full of long boxes so i gotta go and find different boxes um for these comics to fit in and that's the first thing i was upset about i was upset that it was i couldn't fit it in my box so i had to buy a specific box for it and then i I paid for it and i was like this cover is ugly so i see it all the time and it's just like i fucking uh and well, nonetheless. If you're interested in 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 buying figures and stuff um those sculptures that i'm making for this show or i'm gonna try to make a bunch of copies available for people oh, so absolutely. i'll let you know if that happens absolutely man i'd love to buy a few of them and put them up on my shelves man i really enjoyed uh the level of detail you went into it 
Um, so the next one we're going to get into, uh, we, we've hit on this questions? a little. What's that? These are fan questions. Is yeah, well, these are the one, these are the ones I came up with. I've been having a oh. lot of fun with these ones that I've been doing. Um, and, uh, because it, it makes me, whenever you guys say something, so all the names you wrote down for your Mount Rushmore, I'm going to go and research and try to find out more because it, it deepens my knowledge of this, of this industry. And it might've turned me on to some people that I, I didn't know. Um, so therefore I get one person leads me to the next and the next and the next. And then I have this, this repertoire of names and styles and knowledge, um, that's second to none one day, hopefully. Um, but, uh, so movies and TV shows you watch for inspiration. Now we talked about that a little bit with Miyazaki, but obviously as, as creative folks, you know, we tend to go through or have slumps, um, or we have drawers, artist block, writer's block, that type of thing. So if you're feeling not like Chris, right, you need something to kind of like wake up the creative juices. Is there a movie or a TV show that you put on that'll fucking like inspire you right away? Like I said, we talked Miyazaki a little bit, but is there anything in particular that you might put on to kind of get the creative juices going? Um, I wouldn't say that I I turn to media to get the creative juices flowing so mm -hmm. much as just go for a run or something, you yeah. know, or, or just go out in the woods or do go maybe even go to the beach or something like that if I'm just feeling blocked. Yeah. Um. But usually, I mean, I don't usually get blocked, to be honest. It's, you know, you've been doing this for so many years. You just kind of like, you learn to be a professional and just turn it on. It's like, yeah. uh, what is some famous writer said something like, um, I don't know what the quote is exactly. He said something like, creativity, uh, I can't do anything when I'm feeling creative or something like that. He says, fortunately, creativity hits me every day at 10 a.m. or something like that. It's a quote, something like that, yeah. you know. Um, so, you know, you as a professional, you don't really have a have an option to be blocked. Because yeah. if you're, what are you going to do? You're just going to say, you're going to call up your boss and say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not fucking feeling it this week. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's... So there are ways to to boost your creativity. I mean, it's even if it's as simple as just, um, you know, whatever you have to design, you just do a lot of research, you know. Yeah. And and you know, when you when you're out and about and you have your phone with you, if you see something interesting, take a picture of it. Absolutely. And just build that sort of mental vocabulary of stuff and say so, because. You know, every once in a while i'll see like a weird detail outside like mm -hmm. just the way like i don't know it could be any dumb thing like today i i had to draw some telephone wires or something so i just walked outside and i looked at my telephone pole right outside my office and i started to hit picture i'm like wow that's really weird and interesting the way those things are constructed so you know inspiration is everywhere you can just it's it's not oh, really goodness. something that's in short supply for me well that's good um this one's always fun because I've never gotten the same answer twice. If you could be the uh, fly on the wall for any created character, so animation, movies, television, doesn't matter. If you could be a fly on the wall for the creation of any character, what character would you love to see get created? Oh boy. <sighs> Jesus. Um, well, I guess it would have to be a character I like, right? Um. You know, I imagine the creative process for any character is probably not all that interesting, right? I mean, it's oh, it's, a, it's if it's if it's somebody who's working by themselves, rather, or if it's I guess if it's in a if it's in a discussion between several people, that's one thing. Like I was watching the uh, there's a, a Beatles documentary that's out now. That's a bunch of footage that Pete Pete Jackson Peter yeah. Jackson put together, I think. and uh, there's this one scene where they what was the jojo was a man from tucson arizona you know that song i'll um, be real honest i'm not a huge yeah, get back right get back to where you anyway um paul mccartney is just strumming along and humming and just doesn't, doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and the other guys start kind of like jamming a little bit and all of a sudden this song just pops up like that was that creative process is really fun to watch yeah um so I don't know, I don't know 
you know, what particular characters there would have been that, that would go through something, something kind of spontaneous and cool like that. Um, but yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question, dude. <laughs> the only one that I could say that kind of has something like that, and it's and it's been such a heated debate for fuck man, almost a hundred years. Like I can't, I don't know how old Bugs Bunny is, but you know, you'll hear all of the Warner Brothers directors talked about it. You know, I created Bugs. No, I created Bugs. No, I created Bugs. And then when you really yeah. get down to it, it's like everybody added their layer, their flavor, their color, their whatever you want to add to Bugs until Bugs became Bugs. And I mean, there's the, what was it, Freddie Moore, the, uh, for Mickey Mouse, you know, he has the definitive design for Mickey, what Mickey looks like now. Um, and it doesn't really get brought up enough, you know, so it does, characters do go through evolution, but the only one that I can really point to, and like I said, my my information and my, my basis is very uh, journeyman, if you will, when it comes to animation. But the only thing I've ever heard as far as like, super not collaborative because everybody said they created it was bugs bunny um but yeah that one's always fun because it's always interesting to see what you guys pull from um so this one's another fun one uh so you're creating an animation studio right so you get a creator a director a writer a storyboard artist and a voice actor it could be anybody throughout history dead or alive who would you want to bring on who is Chris signing to his animation studio? All right, who's who's the first guy? You got a creator. All right. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go with some of my previous answers for this. That's perfectly fine. Uh, is- all right. It's I would. It's probably Craig, right? I mean, there's there's not very many people that you could put above Craig. Uh, fantastic person, and dude's got. I mean, generationally, I mean, he's got what fucking five six hit shows and it's every stage of my life he was coming out with something so yeah. uh he's transcended the uh the the medium for sure so yeah. you the get thing, a... I, I mentioned before that craig knows what he wants mm-hmm. um but he's also really open-minded yeah at least when it comes to background design i don't i've heard he's he's a little more demanding when it comes to character design because that's more of his wheelhouse uh but you know, for like Kid Cosmic, for instance, um, you know, he just gave me all the stuff that he found, all the reference he found, and he just like, just do what you want, <laughs> you know, pretty much. And he gave me all the artists he loved and all the all the different styles and everything, and he was like, just let's see what you do, you know. And I just kind of did what the hell I wanted, and and it wasn't always what he expected, but he was, you know, if it was something that even if he wasn't expecting it, but it worked and, and, you know, he thought it was fun and he was, he was just open enough to just let you run with. It. So that's why I always appreciated about working with a guy like Craig. Absolutely, man. That's a good boss to have right there. Um, so you get a director. What director are you taking? Oh, um, well, I guess I would just go with some of the guys I've worked with who I know are just really uh, professional guys who just know what they're doing. There's a guy named uh, Eddie Trigueros who directed a, a bunch of the Wander episodes and also worked on Mickey Mouse. Um, and he's 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 done stuff all over town. He's like I saw one of his boards from a from a a Warner Brothers, you know, Looney Tunes characters kind of thing that I was working on. Uh, you know, the Looney Tunes shorts, uh-huh. all the ones that are out now. Yeah, I think I worked on one of his boards and, uh, you know, fleshing that one out. And the guy's just got such a great sense of humor. The drawings he does are just so freaking bananas. You know, all, all the all the crazy extreme takes he does, he's just doodling those in the office, you know, and they're just the most yeah. ridiculous drawings you've ever seen. So I would put Eddie up there for sure. Okay, now you get a writer. Um, hmm. You know, I don't really do a lot of work with writers, to be honest. Um, that's more, I mean, I think, I think someone like a director or story artist works more closely with writers. Um, so I'm not sure I could answer that question. I would just say, um, I would probably just put it with Greg again, because I know he, He's very, very involved in all the writing on his work. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you get a storyboard artist. 
depends on the show. <laughs> depends on whether it's comedy or action or what. Um, this is your animation studio. You tell me what kind of uh, the show this is going to be. Comedy, action, you get to pick. Um, I, you know, I, I might pick my friend Ben, Ben mm -hmm. Dallas Perry. He was, he's primarily a character designer, but um, he did an episode of Wander that was sort of this uh, Lord Hater has a, uh, he has a cartoon made about himself. I don't know if you've seen that episode. And uh, it's, and the guys who, the, the, his watchdogs, his minions who create the thing, they have to cut a lot of corners and everything. So it ends up uh, being this big parody of like one of those old uh, 1980s, like He-Man type cartoons, you know, um, where every, all the corners are cut and there's all these mistakes and, and uh, it's just so ridiculous to look at. And Ben just, he, he boarded the entire thing himself. He designed all the characters. He designed half the backgrounds on the show. And uh, it was just perfect the way he portrayed that shitty ass animation from back then. <laughs> it was just amazing. That's awesome. So, the uh, last one is you get a uh, voice actor. Uh, well, I mean, I would probably just go with, I haven't met a lot of voice actors either, but I know which ones I like. I mean, I love Tom Kenny for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, and, uh, God, what was the other guy's name? There was a guy who, the guy who did Lord Hader, I forget his name, but he would, he was great too. Um, yeah. Real See, quick. the problem is you're asking me all these questions about things that require that I have some sort of historical knowledge about animation. <laughs> and it's not really my bag, dude. To be honest, I didn't really get into this business because I, I freaking love cartoons. I just really like drawing. So, you know, and the more fun, the better. But but I'm not exactly, you know, Mr. Animation Historian. Some of the guys I mentioned are much better at that kind of stuff. Uh. Keith Ferguson was uh, Lord Hater. Keith Ferguson, yeah, yeah, his Lord Hater was great. And then, boom, boom, boom. Uh, this one's fun because uh, you might not be deep into animation history, but I got a feeling that you've seen enough where you might have uh, want to pick one. Uh, if you could have done backgrounds for any movie series. What movie or series would you do? This is through the pantheon of animation. Is there any project that sticks out that you would have loved to lend your expertise to? Well, I can think of a few jobs I didn't get that I wish I had gotten. Oh. Um, I when they did the last season of Samurai Jack, I applied for that and didn't get it. <laughs> so that's always sort of been one of on my on my bucket list is to do something with Scott Will one day. So That's whether it's primal or anything else that Gendy comes up with, primal was so fucking me. primal was so fucking good. Uh, that hands down my favorite cartoon last year. Um, so what smart. they're doing the art on that was so smart. Oh, dude, it's because you could, you could have easily fucked that show up with way too much detail. I mean, you're drawing jungles and all kinds of stuff, but there's... they found a way to just make it just simple and beautiful. There's a guy, I think his name but is But feel real too, you know, in a way. Oh, absolutely. There there was there was there, there was so many things that could have went wrong with that show. When you think about that show, and it's the first, what was it like 10 episodes, 12 episodes was that first season? You don't have a single piece of dialogue uttered until the last 30 seconds of the final episode in the first season. That right there, I, I you can have so many people hooked on that show. There's no dialogue whatsoever. You have to physically watch the show to see what's going on. You can't look away because you'll miss something. Because usually people have stuff on the background. They're cleaning, they're cooking, they're doing something. They can look up, but they're hearing it. So they know kind of where the story's progressing. With Primal, you have to be watching the entire fucking time. Yeah, right. There, there is, There is, I think his name, he's a German cat. You might know him. Uh, you know, he did all the backgrounds for it. Like Christian Schwald. It's like S C H E W A L L D or something along those lines. Yeah, I, I don't know him, but yeah, the work on that show is just bananas. 
the fucking next to yours, the prettiest backgrounds I've ever seen in my life. It, it's it's <laughs> the 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 scenery in there. I mean, there's a water scene where you don't know where the water and the skyline are meeting because it's nighttime, so it's black on black. Everything's reflective. Uh, Spear and Fang are you know floating on this raft in the ocean, trying to find Mirror in the second season. You see all these stars up in the sky, and then you see these stars. One of the prettiest fucking things I've seen in anything, books, comics, TV show, doesn't matter. It, it is so beautiful. It sticks out so much. Like I said, the the art direction, like you said, is so brilliantly done. Could have went so bad, but with the names attached to it, you kind of you kind of know where it's where it's at, where it's going, and what it can be and what it would be. I'm looking forward to Gendy's new show too. It drops in a couple of weeks. Um last one. Now, with this one, you don't have to pick anybody you've worked with this could be anybody throughout history right so it doesn't have to stick with animation this is the last one and this one's kind of fun uh you get five dinner guests plus you dead or alive the stipulations are you have to cook for them so what are you cooking and the second thing is what's the topic you guys are going to talk about so you get to put out the first topic that your guests will talk about with you what five people are you bringing what are you cooking what are you guys talking about so I got to pick five now. Yeah, you got to pick and five. Each person is a different person from history, or maybe not even from history. They could be anybody. Different. You could pick anybody you want. You could bring your next door neighbor Frank. I don't know if your next door neighbor is Frank. It'd be kind of scary if it was, but you could bring Frank from down the street if you want to. Well, I imagine they would have to be pretty pretty good conversationalists. Yeah, this is anybody you've ever find. That, found would, that would mean I couldn't include. Um, King Leonidas from the 300 Spartans. He's kicking the shit out of everybody. Yeah. Um, but that if I could witness anything in history, I think I would I would like to see that. That'd be pretty see cool. See what the hell that really was like back then when they when they had to fight off a million Persians at Thermopylae with 300 freaking guys. Dude, fuck that my dinner like question. Let's let's just end it with that one right there, because there's there doesn't matter what we say for dinner, what you're gonna make, what you're gonna do, anything. King Leonidas for three hundred. That's the fucking way to end this show. <laughs> <laughs> God damn, that's that movie is so fucking good. God, and it's so ah, boys and girls, what steroids can do to your body, and what that movie could do to just the visualization of every that fucking movie is so good. Great pull too. There's actually um a really good book about that historical event yeah um isn't so over the top like the movie is it actually tries to really put you in put you in that setting you know like it could have been a real place i mean the way that the dialogue and stuff works is something you can imagine you know the guys in the 88 second airborne discussing and, and yeah. you know whether about to jump you know the kind of jargon and and stuff it's a book called gates of fire and it's by a guy named uh stephen pressfield that name sounds familiar. I, I love all that Greek mythology stuff. So I guess it's just kind of like from my background. But Have you gotten to work on, uh, we'll, we'll end it with this one, but have you gotten to work on anything that's like super, super pushing into Greek mythology yet? I don't think so. I mean, no. I've worked on, I've worked on plenty of shows that had, you know, mythological creatures and stuff, but it wasn't nothing that was ever like just set in, in that, in yeah. that genre. Maybe maybe that's Craig's next show, which is actually kind world. of surprising that I think about because I thought I always I thought I worked on pretty much everything. <laughs> well, maybe it's I'm, just sure drawn, I'm sure I've drawn my my share of Greek ruins though. So oh, I have to imagine. Um, well, like I said, Chris, this has been a real blast. Uh, where can the folks go and find you? Uh, you know, we can see some of your artwork. We can see some of your sculpting. Uh, is there anything that you're working on now that you can uh, kind of put out there to get the fans all hyped up for? Uh, not spoilers or anything like that. Is there anything that you're working on that you want people to know about really is what I'm getting at? Um, well, I'm I'm always trying to do more of these uh, 3D sculpts, which is something I'm interested in doing more of. Uh, and I have a... Kind of the, the the name I've been using for that. I started with this name, and then it started getting very confusing on Twitter. But and so I I broke it into two different Twitter accounts because the name is I, I don't know where the hell I came up with this. Like nobody can spell it or whatever. But um, it's called Sculpt Duggery, and it's sculpt but with a K mm -hmm. and Duggery. So it's sort of like a play on Skull Duggery. You know, you kind of yeah. get it. 
is just like too clever by half. Um, but now I'm pretty much stuck with the name. So whatever. Uh, so I, that's my handle on Twitter and Instagram, but you can also just find my name on, on Twitter as well. That's when I separated it because I started doing less, uh, 3d oriented stuff and I wanted to keep it separate. So that's just under my name, Chris Suryotis, which is also impossible to spell, but, um, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, give me one um, second. Give me one okay. Second. All right. And we're back. Chris, what were the rest of those things we were talking about? Um, so I mentioned before that, uh, or maybe it was before we started recording, that I do a newsletter that I mm -hmm. pretty much do when I feel like, which is almost never. But, <laughs> you know, when I when I do an article, it's usually pretty good. It's got, you know, it's just kind of like observations of, about the animation business and life mm -hmm. in general and that sort of thing. And I call it, uh, what's it called now? So I've changed the title a few times. I think it's called Keep the Pencil Moving. Mm -hmm. And it's on Substack. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I've got I got an article about, you know, imposter syndrome and something about, I think there's one I talk about uh, how artists are losing their virtue because they're depending on technology too much. And, mm -hmm. you know, just some, if you want a little more uh, in-depth kind of analysis on things like that sort of thing, then, that might be something you're interested in. Absolutely. And uh, also, I'm trying to write uh, a book about, you know, instructional book about perspective drawing. And that'll that'll get done sometime in this lifetime. So <laughs> I don't know, I'll let you know when that thing's finished. How far are you it's into like, it? It's like when I do paintings. I do like one painting a fucking decade, you know. <laughs> I think I'm about 12 years overdue now at this point. So, <laughs> How far are you into the book? Um, how far am I into the book? Well, I've got, let's see, I got it all on post-its right now. It's like, it's like all about, I don't know if you can see all that. A little bit. You can see it with the light. Yeah. Can I lower that? Maybe I can do something. The light's changed since it got dark out. Oh, now you can't see anything, right? right oh, now. it's after hours. This is what's in my head podcast after hours. Yeah, it got dark. So, yeah, it's just, I've just put it all on post-it notes. Just okay. thoughts on on the, all the various procedures on how to draw accurately in perspective that they don't tell you uh, in books. They give you all the basic stuff, and then you do your drawings and follow the instruction. Everything's fucked up. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> this is how not to make your drawings look fucked up. Maybe that's the title. Oh, that's got to be. How do make your drawings first. not look fucked up? I like that. <laughs> oh, I hope that's the title, man. Uh, man, here, yeah, here. Probably, probably won't be, but, but maybe something along those lines. How to not be fucked up? How to not draw fucked up? Fucked up drawings. I don't know. I like it. We should you should workshop that idea for sure, Chris, because I think I think okay. you got something there. <laughs> uh, was there any uh, was there any other websites, links, or anything like that? That you want to bring up and all those um, links that you do have we will be in the show notes in the description so they can click on it okay. it'll go straight to wherever you need them to go uh yeah i think that's pretty much it i'm on tumblr too but i don't even well that's just that's just basically all my stuff on instagram sent over to tumblr right on so. yeah so we'll, uh we'll, i have you send me those links and whatever links you want in and we'll make sure we put them in the description so like i said people can point click and go because uh, yep. we can tell people to go wherever, but if you give them a link, it's a lot easier and they get there a lot quicker. Sure. Um, well, like I said, Chris, man, uh, if it wasn't for Kid Cosmic and seeing your backgrounds pop up, I don't think I'm into backgrounds as much as I am now, man, because you kind of fostered, like I said, this enjoyment of pausing the show and then just looking to see what you guys do. Um, you guys build the worlds that we inhabit for 30 minutes, 22 minutes, an hour, two hours, depending on what you're watching. Um, and I've had nothing but fun ever since seeing Kid Cosmic with going back and looking at your work. Uh, I really appreciate what you did. I appreciate you coming on my show. Um, and there's no better way to end this than he's been Chris. I've been Julian. This has been the What's My Head podcast. And it's been another piece of your childhood. Good night.